Hey, welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jen Ruish, Associate Professor of Public Health at Fairfield University. TOPS is organized by Mike Pesco at University of Missouri, uh, C. Shang at The Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at University of Massachusetts Amherst. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the question and answer panel, and the moderator will draw these from the questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will now turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Michael Darden from Johns Hopkins University to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so today we conclude our summer fall 2023 season uh, with a single paper presentation by Abigail Friedman entitled Nicotine and Tobacco Product Sales After E-Cigarette Flavor Restrictions. This presentation was selected via a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. So before introducing our, our presenter today, um, we have an administrative announcement. With the close of this TOPS season, we are actively looking for more high quality research to showcase. If you'd like to present at a future TOPS event, please complete the brief form on our website, tobaccopolicy.org backslash call, which will be available in the chat. Um, by Monday, November 6th, to be, to be considered for the upcoming season. You may propose to present your own research, or if you've come across someone else's research that would be of interest to the TOPS community, you may choose to submit a nomination as well. So today I'll introduce uh, our speaker now. Uh, Abigail S. Friedman is a associate professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Yale School of Public Health. Her research focuses on the policy determinants of tobacco use and disparities therein, with the overarching goal of informing and facilitating evidence-based policymaking to improve population health and reduce inequality. She's a health economist by training. She conducts work in three areas. The first uses quasi-experimental methods to estimate the effects of federal, state, and local policies on conventional and electronic cigarette use in order to inform more nuanced policymaking that accounts for the differing health impacts of these products. The second line of research considers how new product and tobacco products and policies are affecting disparities in tobacco use, particularly by socioeconomic status and mental health. And finally, her work on mental health disparities in tobacco use focuses on identifying the drivers between these differentials, as well as potential means to close these gaps particularly among adolescents and young adults. Dr. Friedman received her undergraduate degree from Columbia University and her PhD in, econom in the economics concentration of Harvard's uh, PhD program in health policy. Um, Mike, uh, Dr. Michael Pesco, a professor of economics at the University of Missouri is a co-author on this and will, and will be handling the Q&A. Uh, so our discussant today is C. Sang from The Ohio State University. Dr. Abigail Freeman, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you for having me. Let's make sure these slides are sharing so everyone can see what they need to. All right. Thank you for having me here. Today, I'm going to present work on e-cigarette flavor restrictions relationship to cigarette and e-cigarette sales. Before I dive in, I wanna recognize my co-authors, Alex Lieber, Liz Crippen, and Mike Pesco. This paper is very much a collaborative effort. In terms of funding, I want to thank NCI, FDA, and NIDA. This research is supported by two separate grants, one from T the TCORS funding the Center for the Assessment of Tobacco Regulations through NCI and FDA, and an R01 through NIDA. The content is solely the author's responsibility. We do not claim to represent the official views of any of these organizations. In terms of conflicts of interest, there are none. The authors, none of the authors have ever accepted funding from tobacco or nicotine industries. Myself and Dr. Pesco have provided unpaid expert testimonies on tobacco and nicotine related policies. Dr. Pesco also reports funding from Health Canada, ACS and FDA, and Dr. Lieber reports consulting revenue from WHO and Johns Hopkins. <laughs> 
quick overview. I'm going to start off by giving a background on the state of flavor restrictions in the U.S. before stating the research question and jumping into the data and methods. We'll take a pause after methods because I want to be sure everyone is on the same page with what's going on here before I jump into the findings, discussion, limitations, and implications. Some shorthand. I will henceforth refer to electronic nicotine delivery systems, such as e-cigarettes, as ENDS. All right, or I may say vaping devices. Unless I explicitly say otherwise, we're talking about nicotine vaping devices. We're not talking about cannabis here. So first question, what's the distribution of these policies across the US? As of January 1st of this year, the percent of state residents covered by flavored and sales restrictions is about 27%, right? So about 27% of US residents live in a jurisdiction with these restrictions in effect. You can see that the state level restrictions are largely concentrated in the Northeast and the West, though there are local restrictions throughout the Midwest and to a very small extent in the South, All right? How did we get these data together? These data were newly collected by our team. We started by collecting policy location lists from a number of different advocacy groups that publish them regularly and other resources that had been published. We collected the list of all the locations that were not noted. We then tracked down the ordinance text or the legislation text that corresponded and coded up the details of the restriction, including the passage date, the legislated effective date, the products that were affected. So it could have been e-cigarettes, but it could have also been cigars or, cig or cigarettes or smokeless products, and whether it covered menthol, flavors other than menthol, or both. We also coded retailer exemptions, which will come up later, and I will talk more about the data um, as we go. So what you can see here is that we've got about a quarter of the U.S. population covered by these policies, and I want to compare them to coverage of flavored cigar sales and menthol cigarette sales just to make sure we all have the same groundwork. So what you'll see here is that there is, first of all, more coverage of flavored ends restrictions than there is of restrictions on sales of combustible flavored products. So flavored cigar sales cover about 15 percent of state residents and of U.S. residents and menthol cigarette sales cover about 14 percent. Another thing worth noticing is that we really don't see menthol cigarette sales without flavored cigar sales. And for the most part, when we see flavored cigar sales, there's also an end sale there, end sales restriction. There are a few exceptions such as Maine, right? But often these co-occur, which is going to be very important when we talk about the analysis if you're trying to separate out the effects of one of the policies from another. The existing work is thin due to data. Right? So there was a great evaluation of the quality of existing evidence on flavor policies effects, specifically ENDS flavor policies effects, that found moderate and low quality evidence, respectively, that these reduced sales of ENDS and increased sales of combustible cigarettes. And then the quality evidence for the corresponding behaviors is even lower. That's not because the, um, the work is any less, um, less high quality, it's because they're working with less data, largely. Right, So because retail sales data can be acquired within a month or two of it coming out. These analyses have more years of data to work with and also more local and state policies covered than these analyses, all right? Why might we be concerned about the effect of flavor policies that restrict ends that are flavored on sales of cigarettes? The first source of this concern is evidence on substitution. So there are a variety of studies that indicate that when you make ends more expensive or less accessible, you see more smoking of cigarettes. That's essentially the definition of an economic substitute. And I am going to avoid Greek letters as much as possible and try to explain this in accessible terms, right? So a substitute, two substi products are substitutes if raising the price of one leads to more use of the other, all right? But the underlying theory behind that says that if two products are substitutes, the effect of making one product less appealing will be the same direction as the effect of making that product more expensive. And we have a variety of evidence that shows that when ends are made more expensive or less accessible, that we see more smoking among adults, pregnant women, young adults, and youth. And these are different teams, different data sets, consistent findings, right? So that brings the question of, okay, if raising the price of these products may, leads to more cigarette smoking, then making them less appealing may also lead to more cigarette smoking based purely on the theory. The second concern is about the existing studies generalizability, 
So most of the prior studies, first of all, look at flavor restriction effects in a single jurisdiction or state, or they look at multiple temporary policies put into place during the Evali outbreak, the outbreak of vaping associated lung injuries in the US in late 2019. Those later set of policies, we might wonder about whether they generalize because they happened in a context where people were acutely aware of an additional health threat and a more immediate health threat that might be associated with vaping products. And the earlier ones, we might be concerned because as I'm sure you noticed, the Northeast and the West are where we see the state level policies, but obviously Massachusetts and California are not Oklahoma. So it's not clear that that would generalize geographically. And that's concern number one. The second concern about the existing quasi-experimental studies is that they tend to omit tests for causal interpretation. So a quasi-experiment is a method that allows you to get a causal estimate without having randomized um, assignment to the treatment. For that estimate to be causal, certain assumptions have to be met and they should be tested. The vast majority of the studies that claim to execute causal analyses of flavor policies effects don't test these underlying assumptions, so we can't say whether they're causal. The next concern in the existing studies is their short follow-up periods, right? Most of them are a year or less post-policy, and what we really want to know is the long-run stable effect of these policies. So we'd really like to see effects a year on. And then the last concern is that they tend to ignore policy heterogeneity. So what I've done here is I've broken out the map of ends flavor restrictions into two kinds of policies. The first are pure prohibitions. You can't sell these products anywhere in this locality. The second are what I call limitations, which specifically means that there is an exemption for a certain kind of retailer, right? Typically these retailer exemptions either exempt smoking bars where you can use the product on site or they exempt 21 plus tobacco retailers most of the time, all right? So two different kinds of policies. The reason this should be concerning is not just because we'd like to know their different effects, which we would, but it's because in January of 2020, about two out of every three people covered by an ENDS flavor policy was covered by a prohibition. But in January of 2023, it's about 90% of every pe of every of people covered by ENDS flavor policies are covered by prohibitions, which means that earlier studies are likely capturing a different mix of, prod of policy types than later studies. So we want to take those out and understand them. Which leads us to the research question, what are ENDS flavor restrictions effects on ENDS and cigarette sales? And we're going to do this looking at longer run follow-up that is after a year with data across the U.S. All right. So what's that data? We're using sales data from Information Resources Incorporated, newly changed to Circana. It's on 44 states from January 2018 to March 2023. Now, I want to pause and explain what I mean when I say we're using sales data. So these are retail scanner data from major channels such as convenience, grocery, et cetera, for brick and mortar stores. When it comes to us, the data is at the universal product code level. So unique IDs for each product. And we're limiting to the set of tobacco and nicotine products they have there. And they are for each state by four week period. So mutually exclusive four week periods, how much of that UPC was sold. What we then do is we aggregate by volume. So in the case of cigarettes, it's gonna be packs. And in the case of e-cigarettes, it's going to be units of 0.7 milliliters of e-liquid, which I will call pods. And sometimes they may have been pods, but sometimes they may have been in other disposable formats, for example. But we're doing it by volume of e-liquid since products vary and how much of the consumable content of any cigarette is in them. We're aggregating that to total volume sales by state and four week period, and also then having matched them to flavors by total volume sales of a product specific flavor category. So what you see here are the trends over our analytic period for sales of menthol cigarettes per capita, sales of non-menthol cigarettes per capita, which are obviously going down with some seasonality. And then unknown flavor cigarettes at the very bottom, these tiny dots that you can probably barely see, um, indicating that we match the vast majority of the tobacco cigarettes to a flavor, right? Specifically menthol or non-menthol. Specifically, we match 99.99% of the tobacco cigarette sales to a flavor. For ENDS products, you see, again, very, very low on flavor, and it's actually overlapping. That's why you can barely see the red. Um, we're seeing increases over time in per capita sales 
particularly for menthol and flavored ends, though also for unflavored or tobacco flavored ends per capita. The methods we're using here are two-way fixed effects. Our exposure, our primary exposure, is the proportion of state residents covered by ENDS flavor policies, policy restricting sales of flavored ENDS products. These do not include zoning restrictions. So to be counted as a policy for this analysis, you had to apply, apply to the entirety of the locality, um, with the exception of county policies that only apply to unincorporated districts. Those are also included. It couldn't be a policy where it said, this only applies within X feet of a school or a playground, right? We're talking about uniform policies. The approach here is two-way fixed effects. Our variable of interest is beta one in the main analysis, and that's our coefficient on the exposure. We've got fixed effects for state. For those of you who are not so familiar with these methods, what that means is that if there are differences between states that adopt and don't adopt that are time invariant, we're holding those constant. We also have fixed effects by T, which is date. So if there are differences that are common across the country over time, we're also holding those constant. Those can't bias beta one. And then we have an array of controls that fall into three categories. There's tobacco policy controls, which include the proportion of the state covered by flavored cigar restrictions and menthol cigarette sales restrictions there, as well as taxes and a variety of other um, tobacco policy controls. There's also the, um, excuse me, substitute product policy controls or substitute or complement policy controls, which means we're controlling for things like taxes on beer and recreational or medical cannabis legalization, since shifts in those products availability or taxes could affect consumption of these tobacco products or nicotine products. And then environmental controls. And that is a range of controls, including median household income, unemployment rate at the start of the four week period, average heating degree days, but also because our period overlaps COVID, we're also addressing COVID-19 deaths in that period, the proportion of the period that there was a lockdown for non-essential workers, and the total state EVALI deaths announced at the start of the corresponding calendar months, all right, or the month in which the period started. The idea here is that we're trying to take out all other potential bias. And what I'm not going to show you today are analyses where we also drop the COVID period, but the results are consistent. I wanna take a pause here before we do anything else to make sure that we're all on the same page. Thanks so much, Abigail. So that's great. Um, uh, just a reminder that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. And uh, I guess we'll we'll kick it over to our discussant, C. C Shen. Thank you. Um, very important work, Abby. Um, so I just have some clarification questions about the uh, flavor regulation measures, because uh, this is very important. The first time I see such comprehensive constructs of um, flavor regulation. So as you mentioned, uh, there are exemptions, you know. So I um, think I know that there are exemptions based on flavors. So some places may exempt mint and menthol from the regulation, and some places exempt based on retailers. So my first question is, when you create this uh, measure that you are looking at, did you consider the partial policies that with the exemptions and uh, did you weigh them or this is um, just like some information about how they were? Yeah, um, that's, just that's a really important question, see. Um, and, and I should note the version of this paper that is up online on SSRN, the estimates are a little different because we had some updates to the flavor policies since that was posted. The end implications are totally the same. But what we did is we tried to keep it as transparent as possible. So. For those of you, I'm not sure I mentioned this already, for those of you who don't know, the federal government prohibited sales of flavored combustible cigarettes in 2009, right? So we're only looking at menthol cigarette sales. The question is about the flavored ends and the flavored cigar policies. Are we counting or weighting differently somehow to account for policies that don't cover versus do cover menthol? And basically in this analysis, we're only looking with at policies based on whether they cover non-menthol flavors because the vast majority of ENDS flavor policies cover menthol, right? We do in the paper actually have a separate analysis that separates out menthol and flavor ENDS restrictions from only flavor ENDS restrictions. We don't see any menthol ENDS restrictions without flavors, right? So that we never see a menthol restriction. You can't sell menthol ENDS, but you can sell cherry, right? We only see them you can sell cherry or you can't sell cherry and you can't sell menthol or you can't sell either equivalent. 
So for the purposes of the main analysis, it's just a, we're just looking at the flavor restrictions, but it's worth knowing that most of those also include menthol for it. Yeah, thank you. So related, yeah, yeah, I think that's very clear um, explanation of how the, the regulation measure is uh, constructed. But, um, you know, the exemption, there are so many exemptions and there is uh, also the tap you mentioned that exempt uh, specialty retailers. I don't know if that's the, the right term to, uh, to yes. use the, the, the exemptions. Um, and so you are also using IRA, the IRI data, which is also the retailer scanner data. Mm -hmm. So did you consider to match the type of data that you have with the exemptions? Because, you know, I would imagine for the IRI data is mostly capture those uh, places that will be uh, not exempted, basically. Right. So, uh, you do consider, you know, for the places that do have exemptions, but, you know, you are looking at retailer data. So that probably should be considered as prohibited. So let me um let me dig into this. And I'm glad you okay. asked. We were, gonna get in, we were gonna get into this in the limitations oh, and yeah. when I show you the results, but it's good to forecast. So first mm -hmm. of all, I only talked about um equation one. Here, equation two is the first breakout. Essentially, what we're looking at is in equation one, it's what's the relationship of a current policy coverage level to the outcome. In equation two, we separate current policy coverage from the percent of current coverage that has been in effect continuously for a year. So beta two here plus beta one gives us a long run effect and beta one gives us another effect. Later, there's another regression, which I didn't bother putting up here, but I will show you the results from where we separate out a second, essentially a beta three and a beta four, where we have a separate flavor variable for prohibitions that apply to all exempt, all retailers and limitations that have a retailer exemption. The reason we don't, well, there are several reasons we don't match to retailers. First of all, we don't have it at the retailer level. We have it at the state by four week period level. So we can't match to specific retailers in the IRI data. Mm -hmm. Second of all, the big lim limitation here, which pr applies primarily to e-cigarettes is that IRI's data does not cover specialty stores and online sales. All right, so vape shops are not in IRI's data. This doesn't really affect cigarettes. There's a separate paper that we have that I think recently came out. Um, that shows that the vast majority of cigarette sales are actually covered by IRI data. What we did there, I'll give you the short version, is we estimated the taxes that should have been generated by all of IRI sales for cigarette sales, and we compared them to the actual tax revenue in the state, which showed that across the U.S., the vast majority of states are covering, or excuse me, of IRI accounts for the vast majority of cigarette tax revenue, which suggests that it's full for cigarettes. It accounts for the majority of e-cigarette revenue, but not, not anywhere near the like over 95% kind of numbers we see for cigarettes when you're talking about ends. So the concern here might be that changes that we see in sales from brick and mortar retailers, like convenience stores, grocery stores, gas stations, et cetera, might not reflect shifts between sources if people move from purchasing in those venues and purchase in vape shops, right? And I will dig into the implications of that when we get to the slide that separates out the effect of flavor prohibitions versus flavor limitations. Those limitations are what I mean by the, the ones that have exemptions. And what we're gonna do, which I don't think is in the paper, I'm gonna show you some, some extra stuff, freebies, if you will, that we just, couldn't fit in the paper. I'm going to show you the that breakdown by prohibition limitation when we drop Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Because when you drop Rhode Island and Massachusetts, the vast majority, like 99% of the remaining retailer limitation policies are actually 21 plus retailers or 21 plus tobacco retailers are not smoking bars. So it can give us a better sense narrowing in on the effect of a certain type of limitation. But yes, um, we don't know. We were not able to find anyone who had um, data, consistent cross-national data on retail sales of vaping products from specialty stores. That would be a huge, if anyone wants has that or wants to collect it, that would be a huge benefit to this research. Yeah. Thank you, Abby. Those are all my questions. I believe there are uh, questions at the Q&A. Yeah, there are a couple of cute questions in the Q&A um, from Simon Yates, um, thinking about the comparison between ENDS users and menthol cigarette users. They might be very different populations. So how, how do you think about that? Well, in this case, I don't know who bought what, right? It's just the sales data. Um, 
how I think about it outside of the context of this paper. Um, I'm, I'm working with others to look at the effects of these policies on behavior, and we're definitely going to look at differential effects. As I'm sure you know, um, the burden of tobacco-related disease is particularly elevated among non-Hispanic Black and American Indian Alaska Native populations, and those populations also have higher rates of use of flavored, excuse me, menthol cigarettes specifically, and to some extent, depending on what you're talking about, flavored cigars. So, you know, one thing we need to think about here is while this is going to give us a sense of what the overall effect is, that doesn't tell us anything about the equity implications. We need those estimates too. And we might be particularly concerned if we see um, differential effects between flavored products that tend to be used by groups that are have a higher burden versus a lower burden of disease. And great. Can, can you just remind everyone what the unit of time is for tea? It's a four week period there. So, 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 so minus 13 is 13 is four week periods. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yes. That is, that is the easiest way we could figure to cut to, to collapse what we're saying. But yes, in the paper, it explains that uh, T minus 13, this, uh, let's see if I can get my cursor to show you where I'm going. Okay. This uh, one here is telling you the added effect on top of the current policies uh, for the policies that have been in effect for a year or longer. And, and so, this is not a simple, I should clarify, this is not a simple lag because one of the things to keep in mind here is that some policies were temporary, right? So some of these policies were in effect and then they dropped off, which matters, especially when we talk about some of the sensitivity checks. So this is the policies that have been continuously in effect for the past year, because what we right. want is the stable, um, effect of these policies once they're once they've affected the equilibrium. Gotcha. Okay. And so that that kind of answers uh Borum Lee's question, which is how do you think about the interim period? So it's the beta one and the beta two in the second. Yes. In the, in the second. Okay. Oh wait, right. the interim periods? Um so the, yeah. Oh, so the, yeah, the, like separate. dates between the passage and the effective dates. That's not okay. That those are separate controls. So the interim uh, period is the um the proportion of that four week period during which a policy has been passed and it doesn't yet bind, right? And by bind, I mean the legislated date. Remember, we're looking for endogenous variable, or excuse me, we're trying, we're looking for exogenous variables. So we have to use the dates that the legislation states the policy should have gone into effect because any delay in that implementation is likely endogenous to the attitudes, characteristics, and barriers in that particular market, all right? Uh -huh. So the interim period is the time between passage and going into effect. And why do we care about that? Because we know from the cigarette literature that interim periods for taxes lead people to stock up. You see increased purchasing when people know a tax is coming on cigarettes because they're anticipating that. In the same way, if you had a flavor ban and you were someone who uses a particular flavor product and you know that flavor ban is coming down in a month, you might stock up, which would affect the trends. So we control for the proportion of any T period in a given state, or excuse me, the proportion of residents in a given state who are subject to an interim period or in the interim period at a given point in time in order to take out any um, anticipatory responses. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, that, that does make sense. And and just one last question for me then. So in terms of enforcement, uh, so these are gonna be different across different states in terms of how strictly they're enforced. Is that yeah. captured by the fixed effects? Um, no, so what we're getting here is the effect of the policies on, as they are implemented on average, right, on across average. policies. Yeah. Um, the enforcement, we, our policy coding didn't really cover enforcement. And partially that's because it's often not in the legislation, it's often in the rules, or yeah. there might be none, right? <laughs> um, the degree to which that matters probably depends. If you're a small town with one tobacco store, making enforcement work on this policy is quite simple. If you are California, that's a whole different ballgame. Right. And one thing I will do is we'll we'll look at analyses. The main exposure is this proportion of state residents covered, but we're also going to look at analyses where we're focusing on state laws only, where it's a binary indicator for a state law in effect for the whole time, so that we can see on average what's happening with the state policies. Um, that doesn't fully get at the enforcement difference, but you would expect the state policies to have an enforcement mechanism, whereas a lot of the local policies, that's more up in the air. Great. Okay. So we want to see the results. Yeah. And we're going to keep having these moments where it takes me longer to get to the results than expected because I'm working across three screens and the cursor keeps changing its mind. All right. 
first set of results, all right? Here you have the continuous flavor policy variable, so the continuous proportion of residents covered. And what I'm doing here first is I want to convince you that the results are not driven by the covariates. So this first specification has the controls that are related to flavor policies, so menthol cigarette, flavored cigar, the state fixed effects, the date fixed effects, and no other controls. That's the basic specification. And then we're going to add in the other tobacco control covariates, and then we're adding along with the above ones the other policy covariates, like for medical and recreational marijuana coverage, and then all the environmental covariates. And what you can see is this, this is not changing. Regardless of the set of controls, we're seeing a reduction in end sales per capita with overlapping confidence intervals. These are not statistically significantly different. And when we break this out into that second equation where we're separating short run and long run effects, we see a markedly larger long run estimate than short run estimate, right? And the short run estimate is significant, but it's pretty close on the confidence interval. So that should be fairly convincing that when we see these policies go into effect, we do see reductions in end sales. On the other side, we have the effect on cigarette pack sales per capita, and we see similar overlapping confidence intervals as the controls are added with an increase in sales per capita associated with the flavored ends restrictions. And again, the effect is larger in the long run, which makes sense because if people do stock up, the substitution wouldn't kick in without a bit of a delay for some people who stock up because they would have their product available. So this is consistent with what we expected. The next results I'm going to show you are the same kinds of adding controls, but with the binary flavor policy variable. So that's the indicator for state law coverage across the entire four-week period. And we have a separate variable you're not seeing, which is the percent of the state that is partially covered, right? It has local variation so that we are at least controlling for the local laws there. And there is actually, there are two reasons to do this, but let me just first convince you, look, the results are almost identical, right? State laws, similar implications. So there's two reasons we did this. One is because we care about the difference with the state laws. We might think that they bind more, that the enforcement is stronger. Another reason is that we didn't want, we wanted to confirm that any bias due to having a continuous treatment variable and a two-way fixed effects structure was not driving our result. So the fact that these two tables are virtually the same tells us that it's not being driven by some kind of bias due to a continuous treatment variable. Now, I'm about to get a little techie, um, but I'm going to try to keep the language as accessible as possible. So this kind of approach, a two-way fixed effects approach, it can give you a causal estimate if three things are true. The first is you have to be controlling for any other concurrent policies that would have affected your outcome variable and are correlated with your treatment variable, right? And we're pretty sure we've done that. You can't test that as much, but having actually read the legislation, we're very we're pretty sure we've done that. The next two are testable. One of them is parallel pretrends, which we will get to in two slides. It basically means that the non-adopters are reasonable counterf counterfactuals for the adopters prior to the treatment going into effect. And the way you test that is you see if before the policy went into effect, are the trends statistically different or is the difference between the trends essentially zero um, between the adopters and non-adopters adjusting for everything else that you've controlled for. The other concern, which has come into the literature more recently is about dynamic and heterogeneous effects. So this comes in when you have potential time varying effects of a policy. So if it if its effect changes over time or between locations. And so what I'm going to do is use Deches Martin and Dotfoy's method, which is robust to that bias and also allows for a treatment that can go in both directions. So it's not only increasing coverage, you could also have decreasing coverage. And to my knowledge, that's the only one of these robust methods that allows you for treatment, allows you to have treatments that increase or decrease, which is necessary for this study. So these estimates are not subject to any of those biases. All right. This is the Deches Martin and Dotfoy. The one caveat is they don't allow for two treatment variables, so I can't do the long versus short run estimates with this. But again, we're seeing very similar results. This should be pretty convincing that the results that I've shown you thus far are not driven by bias. They are plausibly causal. The effect sizes are quite similar. And to reinforce that they are causal claim, note here before time zero, we're looking at this pre-trend. This is telling us, is there a difference between the adopters and non-adopters before zero, before the policy goes into effect? And here we've say, we're saying no. The confidence intervals are across zero. The point estimates are relatively small. Not much there. 
And then the treatment over time does change. So we should be concerned that the effect of this policy increases over time. Um, of course, we only have about two years or a little more of post period. So obviously we would love to have 10 years of post period, but we need to know what the policy does before we wait 10 years. Um, but here we have a statistically significant effect. The AT is actually not that different from what we were seeing in the other analyses. Um, and this does confirm that you would want to run a check with the Deshez, Martin, and Dotfoy approach if you're looking at these policies because there is reason to think they vary over time. Though a shorthand way of doing that is that short versus long run estimate that we did earlier. Now, I'm going to help you interpret this coefficient in a second by turning it into a ratio, right? So what this means is that in response to a state law restricting sales of, end, of flavored ends, we see a per capita decline of about 0.3 pods per capita, where I'm using the term pod loosely to mean units of 0.7 milliliters of e-liquid, all right? That might not be easy to understand, but let's do the same thing for cigarettes. When we do the same thing for cigarettes, the pretrend is also still close to zero, still crossing with those 95% confidence intervals. And then we see this increase. Again, it gets bigger over time and it's about 0.227. So if we multiply 0.227 by 20 to get the number of cigarettes as opposed to fractions of a pack, and we divide it by the average treatment effect for the number of, for the decrease in sales of e-cigarettes per capita, we get that we have an additional 15 cigarettes sold for every one less pod sold due to an ends flavor restriction, right? So that's three quarters of a pack of cigarettes sold or purchased for every one less pod that's purchased in response to this policy, right? I want to convince you a little bit more though, right? So we, we ran through the tests. It could be causal. It looks like it should be causal. The tests I can run, I've run. Um, but there's some more we can do here because of the fact that this doesn't apply to all ends, right? I can separate out end sales by their flavor. If it's driven by the flavor policy, you would see a reduction in sales of flavored and menthol ends, but you shouldn't see a reduction in sales of tobacco and unflavored ends. We'd expect some substitution. So some kind of increase in those, maybe not statistically significant. And that's exactly what we find. So when we look at per capita sales of flavored ends that are not exclusively menthol. So cherry menthol would be in this, but menthol alone would not. We see reductions in the long run in end sales in response to these policies. We see reductions in the short and long run for menthol end sales. Again, this one is just barely. So one star is the 5% level. And then a non-significant increase in tobacco or unflavored ends, which is exactly what we would expect if this is being driven by a flavor policy and isn't really consistent with it being driven by a non-flavor oriented policy, right? And I will quickly show you the DCDH, Dishes Martina Dotfoy. So this is the flavored ends. If we do only flavored again, we see that the vast majority of that trend we were looking at is driven by these guys. Um, and tobacco or unflavored ends, we're seeing the increase. So it really is quite consistent with this being driven by the flavor restriction. Doing the same thing for cigarettes, this is really interesting. So some people have claimed that these results might not apply because FDA is going to prohibit sales of menthol cigarettes. Apparently that, that rule is still um, being finalized. However, two things. One, remember we're controlling for bans on menthol cigarette sales. So that's being held constant. These results should not be subject to that. Second of all, when we break this out by the effect on menthol cigarette sales per capita versus tobacco cigarette sales per capita, we see larger effects in the latter, though they aren't really statistically different. This implies that 70% of the sales increase comes from non-menthol cigarettes which means that this effect isn't going to disappear, or at least the substitution generally is not going to disappear without menthol in play. We wouldn't expect that. And this is actually similar to the market share, 70% of cigarettes, right? A lot of smokers like non-menthol cigarettes. We're gonna do something else that I think is really cool. Um, this is using some information from a paper that Alex Lieber and colleagues wrote breaking down the flavor, or excuse me, the consumer share by age group of different cigarette brands by flavors. So 
Marlboros that are menthol versus Marlboros that are non-menthol. For each of those, they used data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and they tested whether the proportion of consumers who were, un, or excuse me, the proportion of consumption, so they're accounting for the amount each person consumes, that is due to people who are under 21, whether or not for a particular brand by flavor is statistically different from that proportion for the rest of the market. If a particular brand by flavor is statistically more, has a statistically larger share that is under 21 than the rest of the market, we call them youth disproportionate brands. If it's statistically smaller, they're adult disproportionate. And if it's not statistically different, they're age proportionate. So the goal here is to try to understand whether or not this substitution is driven by a particular age group. And of course, it's not as great as if we actually knew who was buying and using the product, but this is the best we think we can do with sales data. And what we see here is that the increase in cigarette sales is happening in every um, age uh, type, age category of brands, right? In fact, about 40% of this overall effect would be stemming from youth disproportionate brands, which suggests that this is not just adults sh um, shifting. This is actually also likely affecting underage use. All right, this is the second to last set of results I'm gonna show you, and then we'll talk about the implications and hopefully have some more time to talk at the end. So in this one, we're breaking out prohibitions from limitations. So C brought this up at the pause, and I think it's really important. The idea here is that some policies prohibit all sales, full stop, of flavored ends. And other policies prohibit sales, but exempt certain kinds of retailers, most typically 21 plus tobacco retailers or something like smoking bars. What we see here is there's no evidence in our data that the prohibitions are more effective than the limitations at reducing ends use. Now, this could be due to the fact that we're not covering vape shops. It's possible that what's going on here is that there's better compliance with the limitations because it's not as profitable to keep selling flavored products under the table if vape shops can sell them legally, right? That could be what's going on here. Um, but at least there is an evidence for the idea that the prohibitions are somehow more effective. When we look at the cigarette sales, which are not subject to this issue of not seeing where most cigarette sales are sold, right? The IRI data covers the vast majority of sales. We see increases in total cigarette sales per capita for both prohibitions and limitations in the long run. In fact, every age group except for adults show increased cigarette sales for both prohibitions and limitations with no difference between them, right? We're not, the point estimates differ, but they, they are not statistically different except when you get to adults. So what's going on with adults here? Taking a step back, if you are going to switch from one product to another, if you're going to switch from being a user of vapes to a user of cigarettes or a would-be user of vapes to a user of cigarettes, you would need a policy to have restricted your access to vapes, right? If the policy doesn't hit you, it shouldn't change your behavior. What we know about adult use is adults are more likely to purchase their products from vape shops, from 21 plus retailers. So it may be that the limitations don't have bite for most adult vapers who were ex-smokers or who were would-be smokers if vapes weren't allowed. So it may be that the prohibitions are increasing cigarette sales because they're effectively limiting adults who vapes access to their preferred product, but the limitations don't because they don't have as much impact on their access to the preferred product. So how do I get at that? It's kind of hard without the adult data, but the best I can do is repeat this analysis and draw Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Because on average in our data, for the people who are subject to flavor policies, about 62% are subject to full bans and 38% face limitations that allow some retailer exemptions. Now, of those retailer exemptions limitations, we're talking about about 57% are covered by exemptions that allow off-site purchases. But when you omit Rhode Island and Massachusetts, that rises to 99%. So the smoke, or excuse me, purchases for off-site use, right? So the smoking bar exemptions that exist in Massachusetts and Rhode Island are only for use on site. If we wanted to know whether or not this is being driven by the degree to which it restricts adult sales, um, excuse me, adult vaping access, access to their preferred product, we would really want to be looking at limitations that are specifically affecting retail purchases that you can take away with you. And the vast majority of those are 21 plus tobacco stores, all right, or 21 plus vape shops, depending on the language of the law. And what we see here 
is that the results are quite similar, but in fact, now we've got a much larger impact of the limitations. Again, potentially influenced by the, by the data we're missing on e-cigarette sales. But here we see that the effect gets even smaller for, for flavored ends limitations on cigarette use among adult disproportionate brands, suggesting that between the two options, this option of limiting to 21 plus retailers might be less harmful than the full prohibition which doesn't mean that the full prohibition is is good we've still got these concerns but it does mean that this might be perhaps a somewhat less um, restrictive option in terms of not pushing adult vapors who are ex-smokers back to smoking summary of the findings so Overall, we're seeing that there's an additional 15 cigarettes purchased for every one less 0.7 milliliters of e-liquid sold in response to the flavor policies, and that 70% of the long-run effect on cigarette sales stems from non-menthol cigarettes. About 40% of that effect stems from youth disproportionate brands. In terms of looking at flavor prohibitions versus limitations, with, of course, the caveat that this could be pushing um, vapors to different sources that are not covered in IRI, that's not likely to affect smoking. The evidence does suggest that, does not suggest that flavor prohibitions are more effective at reducing end sales. And it does suggest that flavor prohibitions might be more costly in terms of increasing sales of adult disproportionate brands relative to limitations. The implications here are that the health benefit of reducing end use by limiting or prohibiting flavors could lead to offsetting public health damage from increased cigarette sales. Now there are limitations. The first is that sales are not consumption. Remember I noted earlier when we were talking about that lit review that the data on use was not as strong or the analyses on use were not as strong as the analyses on sales. And that's because we have to wait longer for the actual data on use to analyze it, it's on a lag. But because we're looking at sales here, it's possible that the effects are actually smaller on end use than what's estimated by the sales data because people may cross lines, cross county lines or borders to go purchase the flavored policies elsewhere, or excuse me, the flavored products elsewhere, all right? So if people are doing that, if they're evading and purchasing outside of their area um, where, the, where they live, where the policy actually is, the effect on use will be smaller than implied by the sales data for ends. The second issue is the blind spots in the retail scanner data. They omit online sales and specialty shops and of course, illicit markets. So changes in sales could reflect shifts in sourcing. And that again, is most likely only going to affect end sales because for cigarettes, the policy we're looking at here doesn't actually change access to cigarettes. And they're very, very well covered by the IRI data. We don't think we're we, that those blind spots are covering or um, are accounting for a substantial portion of cigarette sales. What do we do with this? So there are a bunch of policy concerns that this should raise. The FDA's PMTA review process, where they review the applications um, for new electronic nicotine delivery systems, hasn't authorized a single flavored or menthol ends, which could be looked at as de facto prohibition. Now, they're doing what they're supposed to do, right? The job of FDA here is to look at every individual product and determine whether or not it's appropriate for the protection of public health. The problem with that is looking at each product separately doesn't account for the mix of products. And the mix of products in the market could become inappropriate for public health if you're doing this one product at a time. Part of that is because when you're looking at data on what the products that were in the market thus far have done, you're looking at a market that include flavors. It may be that the effects in a market that includes flavors are different than the effects in a market that doesn't include flavors. But the problem at the end of the day is that this approach could lead us to a policy outcome that is not optimal in terms of the overall market effects. An alternative here would be concrete product standards. So product standards would say it's not considered safe if the levels of the following outputs are in the vapor in use and tested the following ways. Those concrete product standards would be great because they might also say something like, this product is safe for X years, but after it's been used this many puffs, maybe it becomes not safe. That's not something we're doing right now. It might be that there's leaching from some products over time. Having concrete standards for what is considered safe means that FDA can much more quickly rule out the obviously harmful 
on their own accord products where it has nothing to do with substitution. We wouldn't want the harm that's coming from a particularly toxic product if it's, I don't know, leaching lead or something. If you combine concrete product standards with manufacturer penalties, that is actually penalizing the manufacturer of a product if it's disproportionately used by use, which you can't currently do under at least the FDNC Act, and strict point of sale retailer regulation, for example, limiting all tobacco product sales to 21 plus um, sell retailers, you would have an approach that would drastically restrict access among youth, penalize companies for setting up products that are likely to appeal to youth, and ensure that the most toxic products aren't even allowed on the market without inadvertently leading to a mix of products on the market that is more or that is not served public health. That's one option. We should all be thinking about this because right now the approach of one product at a time might not get us where we want to go. The next concern here is a bit of misdirection. Is the focus on less lethal tobacco products impeding efforts to reduce combustible product use, which is the primary driver of tobacco related disease? Now, somewhat reassuringly, combustible product use has lowered quite a lot in the last 10 to 20 years, but it's still there and it's disproportionately causing death in minoritized groups. There are challenges here that we're not talking about because we're placing so much emphasis on vapes. For example, substantial equivalents, um, the process at FDA where you're allowed to introduce a new cigarette product if you can show that it is substantially equivalent to a predicate, the way that process works at FDA, any product that's new, that say it's introduced now and it's substantially equivalent, becomes a predicate. So you could actually see over time products introduced that are quite different from everything before 2007 because of this kind of chain reaction. Nothing's been done to address that or to address the fact that there's no concern for the public health impact of those predicate products separately. It's specifically not allowed to be taken into effect. There's no manufacturer specific penalties for disproportionate youth consumption of cigarettes or of any product for that matter that's a tobacco product, when we very much can calculate that with existing data sources for cigarettes and cigars. And there's no user fees in the FDNC Act, which means FDA is thoroughly under-resourced for the various things it has to take care of right now, which leads to real concrete concerns about whether or not they have the resources to pay the kind of attention we need to pay to combustible products alongside dealing with new products coming on the market. I'm gonna stop there, and make sure we have some time for questions. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, um, we'll kick it over to our discussant. Thank you. Very great uh, research and important uh, policy implications. Um, so I think my first question is uh, about the, I guess, just some uh, maybe future research directions. Because, you know, first of all, when we think about the flavor regulation, especially the regulation on e-cigarettes or ends, uh, the rationale is to prevent use addiction. And in your data, I noticed that you did such a great job by looking at uh, the the cigarette brands pr preferred by youth or disproportionately used by youth. Can you do similar uh, definitions or categorizations of e-cigarettes or ends so we can understand, you know, whether the you know flavor regulation is decreasing the brands used by or preferred by youth or young adults. I'm so glad you asked that question. We can't right now. So the data we use to do that is the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, and they collect from people who say that they use cigarettes, for example, their primary brand, and they oh. don't do it for e-cigarettes. They just started asking about e-cigarettes in the last few years. In fact, they were kind of late to the game on that. We need to start asking about brand of use for every tobacco product that we collect information on people using in order to have that information. Because, for example, a paper that just came out in JAMA Health Forum, with um, co-authored with Alex Lieber and myself, we found that there are three cigarette brands that are responsible for about a third of underage cigarette use, mm -hmm. right? And they're all actually owned by the same larger corporation. Right now, there's no mechanism in the FDNC Act to penalize a corporation that is disproportionately profiting from youth. And anyone who studied basic microeconomics knows you've got to change the profit function to change the behavior of the manufacturer. We need a mechanism to do that, which means we need to collect this data, not just on cigarettes and cigars, but on new products. And we need some sort of legislative measure, right? FDA can't do this on their own. Congress has to do it. That allows the companies to be penalized when they develop a product and market a product that's going to apply 
it's going to appeal to 13, 14, 15 year olds. I don't care if it also appeals to 21 year olds, 22, 23, that's fine. Find a way to put forward a product that is not going to induce youth use. I firmly believe that the companies can do that. The question is their incentives. Are their incentives going to lead them to do that? And right now there's no mechanism to align their incentives with public health. Thank you. Yeah, so my uh, second and last question is um, about this cross uh, product uh, impact, like regulation impact. So uh, you look at how the e-cigarette flavor regulation may impact uh, cigarette use, right? So it's unintended consequences. However, have you seen, uh, in, I know in your controls, you've uh, also controlled for the uh, flavor regulations on cigars and cigarettes. So. Do you see any results on the other directions, meaning whether the regulation of cigars and cigarettes have any impact on e-cigarettes? I did not prepare to, to put that forward. So right now, I, so I don't want to say anything incorrect about what we found there. The reaching back into my brain. So one of the problems here, which is worth noting, is the cigar and cigarette flavor restrictions are highly correlated. Um, which is one of the reasons that I don't focus on them as much. The first is that we we set out to look at flavored ends restrictions. But the mm -hmm. second is that when you look at the cigarette and cigar restrictions, the cigarette restrictions basically don't appear without the cigar restrictions the vast majority of the time, which means that trying to separate their two effects is very, very difficult. It's a classic collinearity case, right? So whether we can separate the cigar and the cigarette restrictions effects in our data is questionable. Um, I remember seeing some evidence of substitution related to those, but I don't remember which analysis it was specifically on. So there is, but my takeaway from it was that there was no cost, no negative health effect that we might perceive from the restrictions on the combustible products, right? They weren't leading to more use of a more lethal product. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I'll pass back to uh, Michael. Great. Okay, so we're we're just about out of time. There are a lot of questions in the Q and A. Um, uh, we have maybe time for for one, um, and so I'm, I'm I'm kind of curious about the the kind of broader policy effects um, for you know for for states that already have these. What should they do now with these kind of results? Right, and you know this is tricky because the legislatures are also responding to their constituents. And for the most part, there's a lot of pressure to reduce youth vaping, in part because a lot of the people who are trying to reduce youth vaping are coming from demographics that don't have a lot of smoking, right? So trying to convince them that the other thing is a risk when it's not a risk to them personally is very hard. If you've already put the policy into place, I think there is an argument here that backtracking, if you have a prohibition, to a policy that restricts not just end sales, but all tobacco product sales to 21 plus retailers would be preferable, right? The idea here is we don't want to give more lethal products a competitive advantage, right? It's that that's the basic principle. Don't make more lethal products relatively more appealing than less lethal products. So when you get rid of the flavors in ends, you're making the more lethal products relatively more appealing than they were before, even if those more lethal products didn't have flavors, right? How do you make sure that people don't switch the more lethal product and you reduce youth ends access? You make sure that you're restricting those lethal products as much. If we're not going to ban all of the lethal products, which it looks like we're not, there are a few places that have tried it though, which is kind of interesting. If we're not going to do that, moving every combustible product and the flavored non-combustibles, or maybe also all non-combustibles, to places that kids can't enter, 21 plus retailers would be a huge improvement. You know, I see here that someone brought up the youth situation in the UK. So in the UK, when you walk into a store that sells cigarettes, they're not visible. You, there's no tobacco wall behind the cashier where you can see all of the products lined up in their flashy um, boxes, which is a huge problem. There's a lot of great research about how that's a, just a horrible idea, this tobacco power wall. In their case, that doesn't apply to vaping. So the obvious option in the UK case would be, at a minimum, move the vaping products also behind, essentially blind, behind the tobacco power wall where you can only see the labels. Thanks so much. Um, we're going to go back to, to Jennifer to close this out, but I, I want to thank you for a great presentation. Thank you.
Okay, so unfortunately we are out of time. However, if you would still have burning questions or thoughts about the research, co-author Mike Pesca will be available to continue the discussion during Top of the Tops, an interactive group discussion offered immediately following select Tops events this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch rooms with us once this event concludes. We'll leave this webinar open for an extra minute after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the URL, which is an abbreviated link, bit.ly forward slash tops meeting all lowercase. I would like to take this moment to thank our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to our audience of 236 people for your participation today. If you are interested in presenting for us next season, please consider submitting a brief presentation proposal on our website at tobaccopolicy.org forward slash call by November 6. Tops will resume with a new season after a short hiatus. You can also visit our website to subscribe to our newsletter if you haven't already to ensure that you will be notified about next season's opening presentation. Have a top-notch weekend.